An Introduction to Early Modern History, Part 1, Defining Early Modern. What is Early Modern History? If you ask most people, they would have some basic sense of ancient history, or at least of Egyptians, Greeks and Romans, and they would likely know or think they knew what medieval history meant. But Early Modern is a bit different. The only people who use the term really are historians. But as we'll see, even they argue over exactly what it means. The short answer to our question of what is early modern history is that it is the bit immediately after the Middle Ages and before the very rapid transformations of the past two centuries. Early modern history then covers the period between roughly 1500 and 1800. In other words, the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries of the Common Era. Some historians date things a bit differently. Parts of the 15th century, for example, are sometimes included in the Early Modern. The Journal of Early Modern History pushes things back further still, publishing articles about the history of the period between around about 1300 and 1800. But that 1500 to 1800 range is still fairly broadly accepted as the parameters of early modern history. In this lecture, I will talk to you about that date range. Why does it seem to make sense to take the time around 1500 as an end point to what we call medieval history and the start of something we call early modern? And why that word early? What is the difference between early modern history and history that is simply modern, beginning around the year 1800? Before we do any of that, I would like to show you that you already know what early modern history is, even if you don't use that term very often. For most people in England, early modern history can be summed up in two words, Tudors and Stuarts, and also Georgians, up to around the time that King George III went mad. If you know your English history dates, you'll know that the rise of the Tudors and the start of the Regency period correlate more or less with those three centuries that we've just identified as early modern. Richard III gave battle in vain in the year 1485. The first Tudor, Henry VII, seizing the throne from him, ending the Wars of the Roses, and with it the medieval period of English history. Now, obviously, that's a recklessly cartoonish way of presenting historical change to a group of university students. No one in England in 1485 even knew that the Tudors would prove to be a stable dynasty, let alone that their rise would later be taken to signal the end of what we call the Middle Ages. In just the same way, a little more than three centuries later, nobody stopped to consider that they were living on the boundaries between early and actual modern periods of history. Obviously not. For most people, life went on pretty much as before. These periods, medieval, early modern, modern, are little other than convenient and fairly blunt-edged tools imposed on the past by historians. Now then, with that warning in mind, I want to begin by getting you to think a bit about who did the early modern period include. Pause the lecture now and take two or three minutes to do the task on the screen. OK, thanks for doing that. Now, for what it's worth, here's my go at the task, which I did with a little bit of help from my 10-year-old son, who was scarily good in his grasp of early modern history, derived in some part from horrible histories. So here are some early moderns from British history that you can see. And then below that, some early moderns from further afield. Now, if you like, you can pause the lecture and compare your list with my list. Hopefully you've just realised that you already have some knowledge of early modern history, even if you didn't recognise every single one of those names, and if you didn't, Google them. Hopefully that exercise has also quickly put you in mind of some of the various themes that shape historical study in this period. You are unlikely to have read that name Columbus, for instance, without thinking somehow of sea voyages and the colonisation of the New World. Likewise, the names of Martin Luther and Henry VIII probably put you in mind of the Protestant Reformation. And if you read the names Louis XVI and Robespierre without thinking of the French Revolution, 
it's quite possible that you're sat listening to the wrong lecture. Let's start talking about events and transformations associated with the start of our period. When and why did the early modern period begin? Well, we could debate this all day, and there are probably as many views on this as there are early modernists. Early modernists, that's the name that early modern historians give to themselves, by the way. Here are a few suggestions based on traditional understandings of what makes the early modern. So, what kind of events help signal the beginning of the early modern period in history? One thing that we could point to is the invention and spread of the printing press, uh, invented by Johannes Gutenberg in Germany in 1440 and leading to a subsequent print revolution. We could perhaps also point to the Italian Renaissance, or literally rebirth, a cultural movement that revived interest in the ancient world and is often associated with artists in Italy from the late 15th century. We commonly associate it with da Vinci and Michelangelo, but the Renaissance encompassed much more than just their artwork, including new ideas about human potential and a questioning of conventional medieval understandings of the world. Niccolò Machiavelli's new ideas about politics, for example, the practical arts of wielding power, were part of this. We could add Columbus's voyage to the Americas, easier to date than the Renaissance at 1492, but associated, of course, with a broader phenomenon that is often called the Age of Discovery, in which Europeans undertook long ocean voyages that opened up new trade routes and possibilities for long-range migration and colonisation. So, to add to the printing press, the Renaissance, Columbus, we could put the Protestant Reformation. From around 1517, when the German theologian Martin Luther published his 95 theses, criticising the Catholic Church and starting religious disputes that would see Europe divided between those remaining loyal to the Pope and Catholicism and those following Luther, who protested against them and formed new churches, Lutheran, Calvinist, Anglican, Puritan and others collectively coming to be known as Protestant. Print culture, the Renaissance, Columbus and the Reformation, each in their own way is associated with the end of a medieval order of things and signalling a move towards something that we might call instead modern. But what does that actually mean? We use that word modern quite a lot in everyday conversation. Usually it just means recently or up to date. In other words, it's used simply as a relative term, like in the definition and examples that you can see on the slide in front of you. Things that have happened just now as opposed to back then. Sometimes there's also a value judgment, explicit or implied, in this kind of comparison. Modern stuff or behaviour is often presented as superior to the old-fashioned, the outmoded. Unfortunately, those definitions that are simply relational and sometimes judgmental are of no real use to us as historians. We need to know more substantively and objectively what makes a time, place, person or object modern. Now that is difficult to do. And you will not be surprised to learn that academics cannot agree definitively on how to do it. But let me give you my own sense of the sorts of things that we are talking about. I think that historians have tended to associate modernity with changes towards these things. The first I want to mention to you is capitalism, which is to say economic activity by individuals and groups in pursuit of profit and within a system in which markets, supply and demand, dictate price. The early modern period is generally associated with the rise of something called merchant capitalism. That is to say, increased activity by traders, merchants, moving goods around in pursuit of profit. Historians often draw a distinction between that and industrial capitalism, which came later, during the modern period after 1800. Now, the second thing I want to talk to you about is uh, a transition towards what we might call globalisation, including the rise of long-range trade, migration 
and colonisation, which we've already alluded to when we talked about Columbus. From around 1500, Europeans more and more frequently travelled beyond the confines of Europe. They traded, waged war, invaded, murdered, exchanged ideas, learned about distant cultures, engaged in plunder, stole land, enslaved non-European people and created new colonies, many of which eventually, but after the period that we're talking about generally, became new countries. The early modern period saw a sort of early form of globalisation, what we might call a proto-globalisation. Its starting points were those long-distance voyages undertaken by the likes of Columbus, de Gama and Magellan, sponsored by the Iberian powers of Spain and Portugal. These opened the possibility of large-scale colonisation in the New World during the early modern period, first by the Spanish, later by the Portuguese, Dutch, English, French, and on some level practically every seafaring European power. The voyages also opened the possibility of extensive long-distance trade with ports in Africa and Asia, an activity pioneered first by the Portuguese and then the Dutch. An English East India Company to trade with Asia was formed in London in 1600. American empires and Asian trade in this early modern era brought significant changes to Western Europe. For example, the rise of newly wealthy merchant elites and the arrival of sugar and coffee into European diets and Indian cotton clothes and China tea sets onto European bodies and tables. The next thing I want to talk to you about is innovation and discovery linked to the scientific method. In other words, empiricism. Historians like David Wooden have argued that the invention of science was linked to the age of discovery. Columbus's voyage of 1492 and subsequent circumnavigations destroyed a lot of preconceived ideas about the world, bringing new information back to Europe, and so, the argument goes, helping to spark a wider spirit of discovery. According to Wooten, after this, Europeans no longer simply relied on what ancient authorities like Aristotle had written. Now there was a new impetus to find out new things for yourself to base your new ideas on evidence and to test them with repeated experiments, an empirical method that proved a highly effective way to learn new things about the world and to develop new technology to tame and exploit it. The next thing I want to mention to you is the rise of the nation-state and of national identities. This includes the rise of centralised state organisation, In other words, nationwide systems of government taking precedence over the regional or local. Something that, in the English context, one historian called a Tudor revolution in government. Now, you will not be too surprised to learn that historians debate the precise timing and character of this so-called revolution in England or anywhere else. But it is quite clear that the reach of the state extended and strengthened in many countries during this period, not just in Europe. This meant law courts, tax collection, conscription, but also elements of poor relief, even healthcare, education or old age pensions in some parts of the world, at least towards the end of our period. Although it's important to recognise the limits to this, England didn't have a professional police force before the 19th century. At the same time, in many countries, take Britain and France as examples, more and more people began to identify with their nation, which came to replace their older, more local affinities to counties or towns or regions. As the historian of 18th century Britain, Linda Colley, once put it, this was a period in which the nation and national identities were forged. Here, then, is a strong connection to one of the events that we discussed earlier, the invention of the printing press and the rise of print culture. As the historian Benedict Anderson has argued, people only began to feel a sense of loyalty to a nation when they were able to imagine themselves as part of its broader community. Print was important to that. Think, for example, of a national newspaper written in the national language, and allowing every literate person in the country to wake up each morning to the same news stories about their country and its relationship to the rest of the world. 
Now, finally, we talked earlier about value judgments that we often make in relation to the word modern. Modern as progressively good and ancient or medieval as backwardly bad. This is not generally a very useful way to think about history. And this last example that I want to give to you illustrates that, and that is the creation of racial thinking in the early modern period. Before the changes that we have described as early modern, the rise of capitalism, globalisation linked to colonisation, the scientific revolution and the birth of nations, people did not think in racial terms. Most often religion was the dividing line between them and us in their minds. Modern racism was created in the early modern period and linked to its other major changes, most obviously through the rise of plantation slavery in the European colonies of the New World. These colonies were essential to the rise of early modern merchant capitalism, producing the sugar and coffee that transformed European consumer society on vast plantations carved out of land conquered from Native Americans. Increasingly, those plantations were worked by enslaved Africans, and Europeans developed a powerful ideology to justify why black Africans should be brutally torn from their homeland and forced to work in European colonies. They also developed another idea, the idea that they were white, and that whiteness denoted superiority. The term white as a collective term for Europeans was first used in the 17th century in the plantation colonies of the Americas, at the same time as those colonies laid down new laws that privileged Europeans and condemned enslaved Africans to hereditary servitude. We now know, of course, that there is no scientific basis for claims that outward appearance determine intellect or the capacity for physical labour. But early modern Europeans believed that such differences could be demonstrated empirically. Print culture was just as powerful a tool in spreading their new ideas about the shared positive characteristics of Europeans and the otherness of Africans or of other non-Europeans, just as powerful as it was in cementing the new shared fictions about the integrity of European nation-states. So, in identifying the defining features of a new early modern period after 1500, we've mentioned print culture, the Renaissance, the Reformation, the so-called Age of Discovery, and we've looked briefly at capitalism, globalisation, science, the nation, and the idea of race. Now, I want to mention a few more types of change. Transformations taking place within our early modern period, but associated now with its ending, with the transition to fully-fledged modernity after 1800. Because the beginning of modern world history will be a topic in later lectures on the module, I'll try to keep this fairly brief. And I think the first thing to mention is the competing rights of kings and parliaments. For most of the early modern period, in the few places where this struggle was acted out, it was a fairly niche area of interest, involving monarchs and a rich white male elite, the men who met strict property qualifications to either sit in parliaments or vote in elections. That was the case in the 17th century struggles between the English Crown and Parliament. Only later on, in the new United States and in revolutionary France and its empire, did it mean the increasing involvement or engagement of large numbers of people in nationwide politics. Democracy, as we understand it, was not a feature of political thought or practice anywhere in the early modern period. But ideas about citizens and not a king being sovereign with the right to determine the government of their nation were beginning to be articulated and in some rare instances put into practice from the late 18th century onwards, right at the very end of our period. The next transition I want to point to is urbanisation. The early modern period certainly saw the rise of towns. For example, the population of London grew much faster than that of the rest of the country during the early modern period. It was ten times larger in 1700 than it had been in 1485, London. Its population stood at roughly half a million at the start of the 18th century, and at a million by the end of the century. 
but the transition to majority urban dwelling society still belongs to a later period. During the 18th century, even in the fast urbanising parts of Western Europe and the Americas, most people still lived and worked in the countryside. In 1800, fewer than a fifth of English people lived in towns or cities. That was to change dramatically after the early modern period in the 19th century and beyond. Urbanisation related to another big shift that started right at the end of the early modern period, the Industrial Revolution, beginning in England during the late 18th century, although many of the techniques of regimenting labour and factory production were evident on the slave-operated plantations of the Americas at earlier dates. This moment, the Industrial Revolution, is associated with a change in the character of capitalism, as I alluded to before. The new industrial capitalism was associated with factory production, but later on, after the end of our early modern period, it became linked also to the replacement of sailing ships with steamships, the rise of railways and eventually the telegraph. By the 19th century, then, an older, early modern world of wooden sail was giving way to a modernity characterised by iron and steam. Extending that theme of scientific and technological change, innovations in medicine and mechanised farming techniques using new fertilisers also helped to prompt rapid changes that marked a watershed moment in world history. In particular, they relate to perhaps the most profound transition away from an early modern experience and towards the thrills and horrors of high-octane, flat-out modernity. I mean population increase. If you look at the slide in front of you, you'll see what I mean. The point around 1800 is a pivot between a steady population rise during the last century of the early modern period and the exponential population explosion of the past two centuries. As much, perhaps more, than anything else, it's this boom in the human population of planet Earth and all its impacts, not least on the environment, that are characteristics of our later modern times. OK, so finishing with that example, I hope by now that you can start to see why historians tend to divide the modern period up. With our early modern period containing important transitions away from the medieval, but with more dramatic change coming later on, with the birth of a more recognisably modern world around about 1800. That is to say, around the end of the 18th century and into the beginning of the 19th. A different historian to me might have found other things to discuss with you. I've said little, for example, about identity, including changes towards a modern sense of selfhood, in which individuality and self-expression were first tolerated and then celebrated in ways that would have made very little sense to medieval people. This is one of the characteristics that many historians see as very important to the early modern period. I've said nothing about gender either including changing ideas about what it meant to be a man or a woman during the early modern period. I've had to be selective in the interests of time, of course, and you should take more time to explore all of these themes, the themes that I've just introduced to you in some detail and those that I've skated over. And I think that this recent book by Mary E. Wisner Hanks is as good a place as any to begin. As you probably, I hope, already know, it's listed as essential reading for this lecture on the reading list.